excited to be talking to you about building alignment between Inge and product. And I have three Inge and product leaders here with me uh, to hopefully give us some really good insights about this. And hopefully, I'll ask some questions that get at that. Um, to start out, I have a question for all of you, though. Who here is right now seeing perfect alignment between their Inge and product team? <laughs> Raise your hand. Wow. That guy in the back. Lots Wait, there's hands. one. There's one there's out one. there. <laughs> oh, here we go. We got one over there. All right, so we might have questions for, for the two of you uh, after this panel. But I think that just underscores the importance of the topic that we're talking about here. Alignment is really, really hard to achieve with any group and really hard to achieve between product and engineering, but exceptionally important because it's the core engine that's driving what's happening at the company. So hopefully we'll illuminate some of that. But without further ado, let me get to introducing uh, the wonderful panelists here. Um, and for each of the panelists, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself by answering two questions. First, what do you do? And second, what about your current job gives you the most joy? And I'll start with you, Clara. All right. Hey, everybody. My name is Clara Liang. I am currently a general manager at Airbnb, looking after our luxury travel business, as well as professional hosting, so property managers, real estate, hotels. What does a general manager do? I look uh, holistically at the health of a business, how it's growing, the technology product itself, um, sales, marketing, um, and really how it's uh, performing. Um, what gives me the most joy is actually talking to our users. I'm a designer by training, um, so getting out, talking to our hosts, talking to our guests, what is their actual experience with our product, which is a physical, in-the-world experience of visiting a home. Um, I learn something new every time, and it's a constant reminder. It's not what I think, it's actually what they're experiencing that matters. Love it. Josh. Cool. So I'm the VP of product at Robinhood. I oversee our product management, our research, our design, our content, and our marketing teams. And we're trying to democratize our financial system. And so we're trying to really understand people, their relationship with money, and how we can help them and build tools that help them build a better relationship with money over their careers the thing, um, and over their lives. The thing that brings me the most joy is talking to customers. Um, and it's really for two things. One is when you hear their stories and the way that the product has already impacted their lives, that just brings such joy to the team and knows we're on a good mission and so much more we can do. But even better is when you're talking to them and they start talking about their problems and it sparks all these ideas of the products you could go build. That's, like, that's what brings me joy and keeps me doing this job. Madura. Hi, everyone. I'm Madhura Dudgaonkar. Um, right now, I lead a, a couple of machine learning product pillars at Workday. And what I do, I love bringing product and organizations from zero to scale. I've done it multiple times during my career, and I get a lot of joy out of it. And um, the, the, the biggest joy drawing factor for me has been taking on the hardest challenges that the company is facing jumping into the unknown, and finding a way to success with a team. That has been the thing that has given me the most joy. Awesome. Thank you all. So let's dive right into it. First, I want to define a few terms just really quickly. Uh, the first one I want to get at is, what is the role of product management? And Claire, I want to start with you. Uh, this is a great question, because I'm pretty confident every product management role in every single company is just slightly different. Um, and even within a company, it can be slightly different. I guess I would say at the highest level, the role of a product manager is to um, help a team in creating great products that your end users love. There's a lot of tasks that you have to do behind that, setting the right goals, making sure your team is aware of the process of how you're going to create the right roadmap and the right strategy of where you're going. In many ways, your product is the process of how your team works together, um, as much as it is the end bits you ship. But I'd say overall, it's about the um, you know, creation of great products that your end users love. Awesome. Makes sense. Josh or Madura, anything you'd add? I think that's great. Yeah, customer value is, <laughs> yeah, is the biggest thing. Um, I agree. And I think it's about shipping. Like, it's great to talk about it, but if you don't ship those products and the product manager's not helping that happen, you're, you're not actually delivering that value to customers. Great. Madura, what are the responsibilities of engineering? The most important one that I've seen some engineers forget, so I'm going to call it out, <laughs> is your shipping value that uh, your product management whoever is playing that role wants you to ship in the most cost-effective manner in the fast, with the fastest time to market. So that is the primary responsibility of engineering um, as far as I'm concerned. Okay. 
that makes sense. So Josh, given that, we know what product does, we know what engineering does, how do you decide what to build? How does a company decide what to build? So, so the first thing is great ideas come from anywhere, but I like to think about the prioritization really being your customers and your mission. Um, if you know that your mission you know, for us is to democratize finance for everybody, we always kind of bring back all the great ideas and put them in a rubric. Will this actually help us achieve our mission better and be a sustainable business to, in order to keep achieving that mission more and more in the world? Um, but then we just talk to customers and we find out what their biggest pain points are and what their problems are. Sometimes they're problems with our current product and things that we just need to improve. We're a heavily regulated business. Sometimes it's problems that are alerted to us by things that are going on in the industry and in places where we need to actually shore up. Um, sometimes there are things that our engineers tell us are problems that like our servers are going to blow up if we don't reduce this technical debt right now. Um, so we bring all of these things together and then we try to create the list that's going to move our business the most forward to deliver the most value to customers. What's really nice within our company is we talk to so many customers through our research that we don't sit there and go, I think, you think, what should we do? Well, I think this is the best idea. We say, what do our customers think? And if you haven't talked to customers and have real validation for why that idea is going to work, you know, we don't just try to A-B test every idea and see what might actually click with our customers. We try to really get to know that first. Clara, Mandura, anything you would add on that? I think I'd add that... Um uh, having a North Star and actually knowing what we're all building toward is one of the most fundamental things. So we always start with um, a vision and a strategy of where we're trying to go over a two to three year horizon. These are things that are crazy bold bets. They are, it's imagining a world that is much different and um, better than the one you're starting in. But I think charting a North Star and then being flexible on the paths you might take to get there actually help the team be a little more creative in the brainstorming. I think then as you're looking at your roadmap, and this depends on the life cycle of your business, and are you a zero to one part of the business? Are you a 100 to 1,000 part of the business? You take bets that are short-term horizon, mid-term horizon, and long-term horizon, but all, all of them should ladder up in service of that North Star. If you're disagreeing whether you're driving to New York or Seattle, then your roadmap ends up being all over the place. But if you guys say, we're aligned that we're going on a road trip, we're going to New York, and then what you're really looking at are the details all along the way, it makes it much easier for teams to focus on um, the sets of things that will help you get to New York. I want to add one more thing, the North Star, and this activity I've seen people forget to do and it gets them in trouble is not only having a sense of the North Star, what are you after, but very clearly defining when you get there, what will success look like? Hmm. You have to upfront align on defining, oh, this is what success will look like. For example, um, when last year we set our North Star for this year, um, one of the ways we decided we were going to say objectively whether we met our, we are at our North Star or not was, we wanted at least one customer that has used the product, validated the value, and, um, and the signal that we were looking for is they've actually signed up to speak at our user conference in front of all the rest of the customers. So it doesn't matter how you define it, but defining what does success look like very clearly so everybody's on the same page around how would we know whether we reached our North Star. Um, so that's one activity I would definitely say don't forget to do. I think that's great. Madura, I'm going to keep the spotlight on you for a little bit longer. What, what's the role of an engineer in developing the product roadmap? Um, one of the areas that uh, engineers have to play an active role. You can't stay on the sidelines and just look to products saying, oh, tell me what to build and I'll build it. Um, and to uh, Josh's point earlier, ideas can come from everywhere, even though the decision makers might be product manager. When it comes to technologists, we are the only ones who can potentially help the product managers think beyond what they think is possible. So if you look at the cutting edge technologies like machine learning, blockchain, right, and whatever else comes along, we are in a unique position to actually shape how much more delightful the product can be. Um, so let me give an example, so Gmail. How many of you were delighted when Gmail started finishing our sentences? I bet you there was a technologist 
in the conversations who said, hey, what if? <laughs> and how many of you just were completely pleasantly surprised, I was at least, mm -hmm. when um, somebody didn't respond to a question you sent in Gmail, and Gmail said, hey, do you want to follow up? Isn't that amazing? And those things won't happen if the technologies don't play an active role in shaping this, what can we do with the product that's delightful and that just blows users' minds. So there are some companies where um, the product managers have to spend a lot of time convincing the engineers that an idea is really good um, before the engineers will go do this. And there are others where the, uh, that's less the culture. What is the right culture? I'll just throw this out to everyone. What is the right culture to build between product and eng? Is it right, you know, in the way that Google operates, for instance, where you have to pitch your ideas to engineers, and the engineers have to get excited about it, then they go build it, or in others where um, engineers aren't given that much autonomy to sort of pick and choose what they want to go do. How would you guys, if you were starting from scratch, set up a product and engineering team to really operate well? You know, one of the things that I like to do is to bring the people who are going to do all the building into the same room, bring them the same research, the same creative thinking that might have happened in engineering or in design or with product people having conversations and put all the ideas basically on the table or, or like on a bunch of whiteboards. And then I ask the room themselves to vote what they want to go work on. I'm assuming that we've hired really smart people who really care about the mission, the, the North Star, understand where we're going, and that collectively with the right inputs, you need the research, you need some of the creative thinking, you then can kind of, you know, I like a little bit of a consensus vote of the team to kind of go, hey, this is what we think will be the most important thing or set of things that will, that will get us there. And then I open it up to debate because not everybody votes the same and people kind of make their arguments, listen to each other, kind of really hash through what might work. Somebody might say it's easier or harder. A technologist might say, hey, you don't understand that problem. That could, we could just knock that out really easily. And then I let people re-vote. And then, you know, that actually, I've found that that produces a pretty good roadmap and it's not pure consensus. Leadership still can actually take a pretty guiding hand to that if it doesn't totally land right. But I found that when you hire smart people and trust them to all get aligned on the same mission and have these kind of debates, you end up with something that everybody's much more bought into than when it's just delivered and said, go build this. I couldn't agree more with that. I think that um, teams can operate in a lopsided manner for some period of time. But it goes back to actually that North Star and the success metrics um, and being aligned on that. If you know who your user is, you know where you're going, you know what the company's mission is, and you know what success looks like, then the, the debates and the brainstorms should actually come from all places in service of those outcomes. Where I think some of it gets dangerous is when, well, I'm interested in working on this technology. And I think it's, it's incumbent on you to describe how working on that technology serves that North Star or those success metrics in your users. You can make that, that pitch. That's a story and a, a influence skill that um, you should be able to flex. And that's how you get your ideas on the roadmap as well. But it has to be more than just, I think this is interesting. You have to tie it back to, I think, what you're trying to do. And one of the ways you facilitate that is actually put everyone in the room. Ideas get thrown on the board, and you can actually help people flesh that out. Actually, what you said about autocomplete, that's really interesting. Say a little bit more about that. Where does that come from? And you, ask, you can ask each other questions where you either say, Yes, we've refined this area, this idea, and we believe in it. Or let's keep that in the, you know, in the hopper for now, and let's keep working on it until it becomes something we can tie to our um, end success metrics. Um, I think really, really great product roadmaps end up being created. Uh, we, we call it a U-shaped planning cycle. There is company level or team level context and priorities that we need to be cascading through to the every person in the organization. You have to know what our challenges are, what our objectives are, et cetera. And then you make sure that information is shared, but then the creation, the creativity, the roadmap ideas are sourced bottom up, and then you make trade-offs across every level as you're sending it back up through the organization. That way, everyone gets a chance to participate, but it's within a context that is shared and everyone has that same body of research or data um, to start with. I think that helps to create a, a pretty you know, free-flowing set of information, but still ends you in, in the right North Star. Yeah. One additional thing I would say is, um, at least we have seen really great results with it, is 
Um, as companies get larger, the product roadmaps and the box within which you ask people to think kind of constrains innovation on what might be beyond that if you don't give people that box. So one of the things we did as work they got larger is um, we actually created a separate team which doesn't have any specific product charter. We're just calling it Workday Next. <laughs> so there is no box, there is no guidance to them, which is mainly uh, engineers and some really strong product managers. And they are aware of the overall context um, to what Clara and Joss were saying of uh, what is Workday's business about, which areas we play within, but they're uh, allowed to go outside of that box and boundaries and experiment with things. And um, we haven't announced this yet, but uh, later this year, um, something amazing came out of that team. And the assumption over there is most of the stuff they're going to try is going to fail. But we are all OK with it. We've made that investment knowing this is our uh, factory where um, they can go wherever they want. Nobody's going to stop them or um, ask them to build within a box. And that generally helps you not be one of those companies as you are becoming bigger and larger, which just forgets um, innovators' dilemma. Mm -hmm. So it tries to avoid the problems that that particular uh, book describes. So it's working really well for us, I would say. Definitely, if you can afford to, um, try to do that even in a uh, four or five person team. It doesn't have to be a large organization, but having that stream there, whenever you realize that, oh, we seem to be only thinking within this box now, and how do we provide some way for some people to uh, kind of stay ahead? Um, one of the other things I'm curious about on the roles between product and engineering, as we collaborate together, we lock ourselves in a room, we brainstorm. Where do the roles, in your mind, Clara, start to get murky? Well, actually, Mike addressed a little bit of this. Um, I think murkiness happens for one of two reasons. Either everyone thinks they're responsible for the thing and there's overlap, or nobody thinks they're responsible for the thing and they're waiting for someone else to pick it up. Um, and if you actually ask the, the five whys, why is this, why is this, why, is this, you know, why did that happen, it, generally comes down to a few things, I think. Um, I think one, sometimes there's uh, just a fundamental disagreement on where we're going. And so I think I'm trying to do this, and you think you're trying to do this. And there, there's a conflict that's created. Um, you know, are we trying to cut bugs, or are we trying to um, you know, ship the next feature faster or whatever? And you, sometimes you have that misalignment. I see also um, it's just a mis, uh, miscommunication. Um, hey, Josh, I noticed you're doing this, but I'm also doing this. Should we talk through it? And um, you know what Mike was sharing, I think, with the, um, the contract and the conversation is one way to get to that. But there's just nothing more powerful than grabbing someone saying, am I crazy, or did we both try to do this? And you're like, yeah, 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 I don't need to do that. You want it? All right, you got it. Um, I think the third, and this is maybe the more nefarious when it happens, is low trust. Um, I know it needs to be done. It's probably Josh's job to do it, but I'm not sure I trust, so I'm just going to keep doing more of that. I think that actually starts to become um, a negative seed that you should watch out for. And rather than trying to step in and do someone's job when you don't think it's happening, having that middle conversation of saying, there feels like there's something off here, can we talk about it? And just being really open with each other, not in a mean way, but just in a how can we help each other way, um, sometimes sheds light on it. I didn't even realize I was missing that. Thank you for bringing it to my attention, is what I often hear when, when those conversations happen. But you know, overall, I think it's because people either all think they own it, or nobody thinks they own it. I don't know what you guys think. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. Uh, the one specific area that I constantly see the murkiness play a role uh, when building products is dependency management. So yeah. uh, that's a tricky one. And uh, you, the thing what Clara is saying, you have to be very explicit, even if it's murky, whenever there's murkiness about, hey, yeah, this generally is your responsibility. And this happened with us in, even just uh, two weeks ago where uh, we were close to shipping to production, and uh, some of the performance testing tasks that we were doing cross-team were just s spiraling at the, well, the, even just the design 
the, all the engineers from different teams weren't agreeing on uh, what is it, what, what are we trying to achieve here? And the product management um, didn't know enough nuances when it come, came to that particular area. So I explicitly talked to the product manager involved and said, hey, even though you generally handle dependency management in, uh, across different teams, I'm going to run this because some of these uh, uh, architects, they're very strong-headed, and you, uh, I think I need to be in there for us to get this conversation moving forward bef so that we can ship in time. So we had that explicit conversation. I ran through that activity uh, for the team. And then once he got to see it, what is it that we were trying to do? We had a blueprint around, OK, these are the things we need to measure, and this is what it should look like, and this is what would mean we're good or not. Then the next performance testing for other uh, customers, I asked him to take it back over where, OK, you can run through this. Bill. Regardless of which areas you get murky, being very explicit about, um, who, who should be doing this at this point, doesn't matter whose responsibility it is, that conversation has to happen so it doesn't get um, out of control and doesn't just simmer under the surface. One of the things that on this topic that we introduced at Coursera that I found helpful, it's the exact same topic, it's just we introduced the framework of an owner and a stakeholder. And especially as we started to scale beyond product and engineering to include sales team, biz dev, et cetera, there were many more stakeholders. Some of them thought they were owners, or and there were multiple owners, or it was all stakeholders and no one knew who was the owner. So just by the simple fact of saying this person is the owner, the rest of everyone is a stakeholder, it like clarified a, a tremendous amount and allowed teams to unblock themselves that we found very useful. It's the same exact concept that everyone's talked about. Okay, we have reached the five minute mark, which means we're at the time of the panel where we're gonna play a game. And this game is gonna be called Underrated versus Overrated. And it's as simple as the title suggests. I'm gonna ask the panelists a series of uh, questions and they're gonna tell me whether or not they think a certain topic uh, is overrated or underrated with a very simple one sentence explanation about why they think that's the case. So uh, hopefully it's a little bit of fun. We'll hopefully move a little quickly. And we're gonna start with Clara. And the first one, overrated versus underrated, stand-ups. Underrated, deeply underrated. There's nothing that replaces even a five minute quick check-in, what's the state of things, especially if you're in a war room mode or shipping mode, um, quick alignment, highlights, blockers, things I need you for, sets the entire day, week, month for success. Strong endorsement, Josh? Underrated, same reasons, but also stand-ups work great, even if you're not physically in the same space, but are doing it over Slack or, or in other remote ways. Everybody focusing for five minutes on what everybody else is doing and just having that, that moment creates so much more clarity. Underrated, um, I'll say the same. And the Main thing, I think it's underrated, is because people just don't do it right. It ends up being a status update. So The yeah, panel underrated. has spoken. Stand-ups, underrated. Uh, Josh, detailed specs, underrated, overrated? Overrated. I think that you often spend so much time writing this giant document that gets out of date two weeks into a, a project, I think it's much clearer to have a clear mission, a clear North Star, and as much of the information as you can, but it's gotta be something that evolves over time um, as you learn more. Mandura, let's go to you next on that one. Um, detail spec, what used to be the long documents are overrated, but I think um, the acceptance criteria, stories, and being very clear about what you're trying to do um, is underrated. Um, and a lot of teams don't do it as diligently, but it's really critical. Um, okay, Clara? Detailed specs, overrated, one-pagers that frame up the problem and where you're going, and success criteria, underrated. Okay. Uh, meeting notes. Let's start with Madura. Meeting notes. Um, Two-page meeting notes, overrated but at least capturing action items and who's gonna take care of what minimum, that's underrated. Josh? Uh, meeting notes are underrated. Uh, the amount of time you spend after a meeting to actually collect what was said, get it documented, if you need to update these other documents that are, that are works in process, um, 
doing that after the meeting. I often sometimes spend as much time after the meeting as I had spent in the meeting <laughs> recalibrating everything because it's that important to have everybody on the same page. Clara? I think it depends on the size and scope of your team and who's in the meeting. If you're doing daily stand-ups and it's four of you, meeting notes are way, way, way overrated. I think that if you have a distributed team, people are traveling, not always able to attend, and there's complex stakeholders, then it's underrated because actions and follow through, um, and it allows people to actually stay in touch even when they're not in the same time zone. Stay here. Product managers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, Really good product managers should be 10Xers of a team. And if you don't feel like they are 10Xers of a team, then they're highly overrated. Um, but uh, really great product managers generally tend to be underrated, but they should be 10Xers of Qualification, and you get underrated for the, with that qualification. Josh. Uh, she said it perfectly. The, the great product managers make a team so much better. They're always underrated on how much better a team can get. There aren't that many of them, and all the ones who try to be them and try to take control and say, I'm the CEO and get out of my way. So overrated, like get them off your team. <laughs> Madura. Product management role is underrated. I mean, I know small teams can't afford to have dedicated product managers, but that role is so critical and can the make, the, make the difference between success or disaster. Madura, tech debt. Tech debt. Um, overrated, underrated. It's overrated if you haven't found product market fit don't bother. If it's underrated, if you have customers and you're hyper growing, then that's underrated. There's good debt and bad debt in life, just <laughs> like in technology. You gotta be really conscious of when you're taking a loan and mortgaging your future and sometimes to find product market fit or to get something to customers that you need to, uh, you know, fight a competitive threat. You take on the debt, you know you're gonna have to pay it off later. Tech debt where you're just being sloppy, like, like it's, you know, you should always avoid that. What they said. All right. <laughs> Last question for each of you, and we'll close it out here. Uh, Madura, let's start with you. On what's the best piece of career or life advice you've gotten? Why did you have to start with me? I told you I couldn't remember. Okay, I'm going to make it up. <laughs> um, no, so the best one, career or life, I guess this is all, this is something that runs in the back of my mind is um, not saying no to new experiences, mm -hmm. however uncomfortable it makes you, more uncomfortable it makes you, do it. Hmm. Um, that's probably the thing that runs as a theme in my life, both career and otherwise. Best one for me is uh, something my wife said to me when I was doing different job interviews or trying to figure out what I want to do. She said, stop taking calls and start making calls. And instead of just <laughs> take the opportunities that come into you, that sort of look like they're there, that seem easy, find the ones you really want to go do, go out and make the calls to make those happen. That's good. Well, I was going to say what Madura said, which um, is actually if the job doesn't scare the living daylights out of you, don't take it because um, you're not going to learn enough or grow enough. Um, but since she already said that, I think what I would um, add is um, bring your authentic self to work. And that is going to be the foundation of trust. Be real, be honest, be vulnerable, be um, excited, and uh, use that to really build a trusting foundation with who you work with. And with that, we are done. Please join me in uh, thanking our panelists. <laughs>